Hello, welcome to my presentation, What is New in Pester 5? I'm Jakob and I will guide you through the new features in Pester 5 and uh, show you why is it awesome. Please, let's thanks to the sponsors, which is Microsoft, System Frontier, Script Runner, and PowerShell One. And also huge thanks to the whole team around PSConTU, which brought it to you even in such hard and trying times. I'm really looking forward to joining the conference every year, and I'm really looking forward to join it in 2021 again. I will first talk about a bit of history about the development of Pester 5, then I will show and demo all the new improved features, like uh, the new interactive uh, approach in VS Code, the tags and skips on everything, mock scoping and uh, the new way to comp mocks, selecting should failures, and the new and awesome result object. Then I will talk a bit about breaking changes and the migration. So let's start with a little bit of history. I started thinking about uh, how to enable the new features in Pester 5 somewhere in 2017, but what I can track back, in June 2018, I actually started the development. Then. In January 2019, which is a long time ago, I published the first Alpha 1, and that was the first public preview of Pester 5. This version uh, had a lot of stuff broken, and it worked quite differently from what Pester 5 works like right now, but it was the first preview and it was the first uh, showcase of what is coming. What I didn't know is that it will take another year, to be able to even get into working state. So then on March 2019, I had my first test run passing and that was very exciting times because seeing all your tests going green or at least the subset that I was using at, the same, at that time was very, very rewarding. Then in May 2019, I released the first Alpha 4 and the first Alpha 4 or the Alpha 4 worked pretty similarly to what Pester 5 works like right now. So that was the first nicer preview where most of the stuff actually worked. And in February 2020, I published beta and it had lots and lots of fixes. And uh, it was actually pretty stable and stable enough to be used for new projects. Then during April 2020, I've been publishing uh, release candidates one to five. And I think right now I'm up to nine. And then in May 2020, there was a first general availability release, which was, I think, RC7. And now, by the time you're watching this presentation, Pester 5.00 is finally released. Yay! So, the new features. Let's dive right in. So this is mostly demo driven because I don't want to bore you with presentations and with slides. So let's switch to Visual Studio Code. And what I have here is my own build of uh, the extension for PowerShell for Visual Studio Code because there are still some uh, changes that I want to commit, but I they didn't get into the preview really yet. Those are mostly around uh, the debug output and the output and so on. So the settings that I have here right now is this use legacy code lens, which I have enabled. And then I changed those from the standard detailed, which you can right now only see in my own version. So for the current experience that you have with Pester in Visual Studio Code, you would be able to see this run test only on describe and uh, it would be the top level describe or like a child level describe. So you can go ahead and you can click run tests and it will run the tests. Even though right now we are running in Pester 5, it just enables this old kind of thing. Now one thing that's pretty annoying is that I have a context here which is also a valid block and uh, I don't see any reason why run tests should be here but they shouldn't be here. So you can go to your settings and you can disable this to enable the full power of Pester 5 in VS Code. So what I have here now is that I have run tests or run test 
on every block and every test. So I can go here and I can just run directly test, which will execute just this test. It will also execute all the setups that are associated with it. So it will run this before all, this before all, this before all, but it won't run anything else. So this very slow before all will not run because it's filtered out. And I also have a breakpoint here, so I can click debug test and I will land directly in this test, debugging it. I can go ahead and I can evaluate stuff or I can just continue running and see that it fails. So this is something that I wanted to have for a very, very long time to be able to just target a single test inside VS Code. And now finally with Fester 5, it's possible. So let's go on to the next file. So I said debugging. And so something that has been very painful to debug in the past are mocks. So a mock is very difficult to debug or was very difficult to debug because we took your script lock and we changed it and then we executed it. So if you set a breakpoint, the breakpoint wouldn't be hit, but I changed that. So now you can actually debug your mocks. So what I have here is that I have an inline breakpoint. You can trigger that with shift F9. I just want to show you that you don't have to reformat your mocks to be able to debug them. Just set an inline breakpoint. But to make it easier to see, I actually reformatted my mocks to each of the blocks have their own line. So what I can do here now is that I click debug test and it will go here. It's not surprising because this part didn't actually execute any of the script blocks that are associated with the mock. So at this moment, I'm at the point where get emoji, which is a mock, will be executed. So I can go on, I can jump to the next breakpoint, and this parameter filter is hit because mock internally will evaluate all the parameter filters to see if any of the parametric filtered uh, mocks will execute. So I jump forward and we didn't specify any emoji, so it cannot be equal to fire truck. So we jump forward and we land in the default mock in here. So now we will return fire and because we return fire, this should be will pass. And we jump to the next step. So the next step is another assertion where we call a parametric mock and this parametric mock will grab this fire truck and it should land here. So let's see if that works. So we again jump into the parameter filter. Now this time, emoji, we can evaluate that. Maybe we can't. Let's try one more time. Copy and paste, and that doesn't work. So I will just press F8, evaluate this line, and it will return true. So this one should pass. And it does, and it ends up here in the mock with and will return fire truck. So this assertion should also pass, and the whole test should pass with it, which happens. So this way we can debug mocks just by setting breakpoints inside of them. Pretty awesome, I think. And it was it has been a limitation for a very, very long time. But one thing that's not very nice is that this is a bit fiddly. So you have to know how the flow works, you have to think about it, and uh, you can make mistakes. So what would be much nicer is to get greater visibility when we debug. So to do that, I will go back here into my settings, and uh, I will set this debug output verbosity to the default, which is diagnostic. Save that, and we'll try to run those tests. I'm sorry, I'm in a wrong file. So here I will try to debug test again. And immediately you can see that we get more information. We get information from discovery, we get information from filter, and we ended up in here defining the mock. So I jump to the next step, and you can see that it gives you information about everything that it did internally, 
So it says setting up a default mock for get emoji. So a default mock is a mock that doesn't have a parameter filter and we don't have a parameter filter. So that agrees. And it says we are in a test. So it finds, it figures out that it's inside of a test, not inside of a before all block and returns the mock table from there. Tries to find the get emoji command. And first it tries to find it in the color scope and it found it, so it's uh, satisfied. Then it sees that it doesn't have a mock hook yet. So a mock hook is the function that we define behind the alias to be able to actually do the mocking functionality to replace uh, the function with your own behavior. And so it defined a new one, which is called like this. And if we queried the commands, we would actually see this function and could see how it's defined. And then it's adding a new default behavior. So a default behavior would be this because we don't have any parameter filter. I jump forward. Uh, the same thing happens for the parameterized mock. It's very much the same apart from actually resolving the get emoji to an existing hook. So the hook already exists. We will not define it again. And so we just add the behavior to it. And it says this is a parameterized behavior because we provided a parameter filter and adds this one. So that's the plumbing done. Now we are again at the point where we will actually be invoking the get emoji uh, mock. So let's see what happens. I call the mock and it says I invoked the get emoji mock from the block process, giving you information about where it's coming from and then it tries to find the actual behavior. So first it looks inside of a test because we are inside of a test and it found some behaviors. But because this is a parametric filter, um, we need to figure out what actually, or this is a mock, we have to also consider parametric uh, mocks to be able to figure out what actually needs to be invoked. So we go forward and we also look in the parent blocks and the parent blocks of those blocks. We didn't find any, so we have just two behaviors for get emoji. One of them is this one and the other one is this one. So to be able to figure out if the parametric mock should run, we have to evaluate it. So we run the filter and we say, this is without any context because there were no parameters provided to get emoji and we will see what a context is in a second. Then the filter didn't pass because apparently the emoji wasn't defined and wasn't, didn't have the value fire truck. So we are falling back to the default behavior, which is fire. And then it just executes the behavior and that's it. We passed the assertion and we are in the next step. We can jump forward in the second assertion and this time we should use this behavior because we passed this parameter filter. So let, let's look at what happens. So we again find all the behaviors. We found two again because we are still in the same test and then I'm running this mock filter but this time I run it with a context and context is the parameters that you provided to the get emoji or to the mocked command. It says the context was emoji equals fire truck and this would list all the parameters that we provided. And because the filter passed, we will use the fire truck uh, script block, the fire truck behavior. And so again, we pass this test and uh, this gives us much more visibility into what's happening inside of the mock and it's automatically triggered when you debug test. You don't actually have to do anything. I just had to change the settings because I was switching from the default to be able to show the previous demo. But in your case, it will be enabled by the default in the latest PowerShell extension preview. In this demo, I want to show you the new capabilities of tag. Now we can put tags not just on describe and context, but you can also put them on it. And that's really nice because then you can organize your tests in any way you want and you are still able to tag them appropriately. So here I am using this mysterious pester preference variable. 
which I just deleted. Let's just go back and execute with F5. I'm using this to be able to show you the debug messages from filter and also to set my output detailed when I will be using it. not interactively, but from the command line. So first, I'm just going to go ahead and just invoke Pester as you normally would without any filters, and it will invoke the tests from all the blocks that I have in here, as you would expect. Then I can go on and I can just run the tests which are tagged with Windows. And it will just run from this describe again, as you would expect. Then I can run tests which are just marked with A. And you can see that it runs from here and it also runs from here. So I can run tests from different describes based on the tag, if they are tagged with the same tag. I can also use it to invoke tests with multiple tags. So every test that has at least one of those tags will be invoked. So I am invoking this test and this test. And just for interactive use, you can also use like wildcards to match the tag. So I can see everything that starts with B, I want executed. So that again will be this test and this test. What doesn't work right now is specifying I want to run all the tests that have tag A and don't have any tag at all. So this, uh, this syntax won't work because it's very hard to document and it's very hard to see from the result object what parameters you actually specified. But it might be coming in the future if there is enough requests. In the next demo, I want to show you a small real life example of tagging. So we have this context and we tag the, all the tests inside of it with acceptance. And then we have some tests that are slow, some of them are flaky, some of them are Windows only, some of them are Linux only, and then we have unit tests that we at the moment don't really want to execute. So I'm gonna go ahead, again, set the pester preference to the correct setting, or to the correct setting for this demo. You don't actually have to do anything to enable this tagging to work. And I will set the path, and then I will just run all the tests that are acceptance, but I will exclude flaky, slow, and Linux-only tests because I'm running on Windows right now. And all the tests are selected and passed. So we end up running only those two tests because they are both acceptance and not Linux or slow or flaky. While tags are useful to figure out the tests that we want to not run based on a given filter, sometimes we want to skip test entirely, maybe because it doesn't work, maybe because we are still working on it, or maybe because we have some other reason to skip it. So previously, you were only able to specify skip on it, but now you can also specify skip on a whole block. And I want to show you how that works. So first, I'm going to go ahead and just set the pester preference to show you logs from skip. And then I will run tests. And you can see that we get logging that uh, says why the test is skipped, and that the test is actually skipped, marked by yellow color and this exclamation mark. And in this case, most of the tests here are skipped, but sometimes because the test didn't really work and you want to figure out why it doesn't work and re-enable it, you might want to do some work, do some fixing on the test. So I can go here, set a breakpoint. And now if I click debug test or run test, I will actually explicitly request this test to run and the test will run, even though the skip flag is still on it. So this is useful just for debugging. So it only uh, ignores the skip flag if you target this test really explicitly. So if you just say this real test should run. And so now I'm debugging. I didn't have to remove this flag and by accident then merge it or commit it into my repo. So it's much easier for me. And I go ahead and see that the test doesn't work. And the same thing applies to the scribes. So I can go here and click run tests. 
and all the tests in this describe will run even though it's itself marked with skip. But let's see what happens if I invoke this describe and then some child or child of a child describe is marked with skip. In that case, the test free, because it's skipped, will still be skipped because we didn't target it explicitly. So what I'm not doing is that I'm not ignoring all the skips, I'm just ignoring the skip on the item that you explicitly invoked. So you can run those tests, but because it might inadvertently invoke this test, I'm not trying to guess on your behalf, so I rather skip the test. Another new feature in Pester 5 is that we have this shoot error action preference where we can set it to continue and that will make the shoot continue to the end of the test, collecting all the failures from all the assertions that you have in the test. So normally, in the normal uh, shoot setup, you will stop at the first failure. And so when I run this test, I will pass this check because the object is not null, but then here on the name, I will fail and it will stop the test and I will just get a single failure from the test. So if I go ahead and fix this, I will then get a failure from this test. So it would be much nicer if I could enable uh, collecting all the failures and I can do that now by setting this pester preference and let's see what happens when I rerun the test. So this time I get two errors. One of them is this name, Tomasz. Uh, was expected, but actually I got Jakob. And I also expected 27, but got 31. So I got failures from both of those. And that gives me all the complete information about why the test failed, and I can go and fix it quicker. Now, one thing that you might want is that if the user is actually null, it will fail fast. So right now I would get multiple errors, but by enabling this error action stop, I can actually say this is a prerequisite for all the other checks that are below. So if this doesn't hold, then just stop at the first failure. And this is also nice because this is an infrastructure thing inside, inside of Pester. So I'm actually collecting all the errors that occur during the test. And so even if there is an error, an error inside of the after each, I will collect it as well. So right now I will stop here, but then I continue to the teardown. It throws an exception. And before in version five, we would just see this error, but now we can see both. So we can see that the test actually somehow worked, but then in the after each failed, which I think is pretty nice. In the next demo, I want to show you the new result object and how many new features it has and how easy it is to go for it. So what I did here is that I just invoked Pester, pointed it to a single test in a file, and I captured the output in the dollar result using this dash pass through switch that you know from Pester 4. So I have this dollar result here, and I'm just going to go ahead and add a watch. You don't have to do this. I'm just doing it to get more space and less noise than in this. But you can look into it directly in this variable screen. I'm going to minimize that. It's dollar. And then we can for it. So at the start, you can see when this is closed that the test failed or that the whole test run failed, uh, described by this shorthand here with a minus. And I just called it faster because I couldn't figure out anything better to use. And then I can go down and I can navigate through the object and I can go here into containers. So a container represents a single file or a script log or some other uh, source of tests. In our cases, it will be files. And we have just a single container is the get emoji file that we looked at before or that we specified to use for the run. And we can open this and we can see that 
this failed. So I'm going to go ahead and open this. I can see that this is a type of file. I can see the whole item attached here, which is just a file info object that you get from get item. And I can go here and look at the blocks. So I see I have a single block in there. And the block is called get emoji block and it failed. So I can expand that kind of like in a tree view. And I see that it was called get emoji block. I can see the whole path to it because at the top level it just has get emoji block. So it's the same as the name. And then I see there is no extra blocks in this block. So I can go to tests and look at the tests. And there are two tests one that passed, gets cactus. And the other one that fails gets avocado. So I expand that, can again look at it. So name is gets avocado, the path is get emoji block gets avocado. So this is the name of the parent, this is the name of the actual test. And it doesn't have any associated data which would be coming from test cases. The result is failed and it has a collection of error records associated with it. So we can look at that. And we can see expected strings to be the same, but they were different. We can hover over it and we get the actual output from the should failure, which is a pretty nice way of seeing of what failed and going through the object and discovering what's inside of there. We can also expand this. We can look at more of the features. If there were more errors, we would see more errors. And uh, it gives us all the details that Pester would normally have because it uses this to print screen. But I don't have to do it this way. What I can do is that I don't have to drill down into the object to find the failed test. I can also go to the result, scroll down to failed, failed blocks and failed containers, and I see there is failed test in here. So that's get avocado. And I can see the same uh, same data because that's the same object. It's just linked into a different place. In the result object. I can again look at the error record and look at the actual failure. So this is a very quick way of seeing an overview of all the tests that failed in the run. And this also works very nicely in the command line. So I'm just filtering out some properties in here because I didn't get uh, to actually filter them in the release. And let's see at how it looks in the command line. So let's look at that. So we still see that we have some containers. We have only one. We still see the sign. And we still see here that this one failed, that we have some tests that passed, and that's all the tests that we have are here. We see discovery duration, or we see the actual duration, which is all the durations added together. We can see where we executed it, and if it was actually executed, which version of Pester was used, and which version of PowerShell was used. Lots and lots of useful information on the object. We drill down into the result container. Let me just execute that real quick one more time. So this is how the actual container looks like. Again, information, how many tests, how many failed tests we have, uh, how many blocks, and so on. Everything that you see in here is also in the command line. Then on the blocks, we see overview of the actual blog. Here we have a lot more information. We have links back to the root, links back to its parents, and uh, all the setups in terms that if we would have any. And then on the actual test, we see the test that we have. It's the first test. We see the name, the path to it. It had no data. What is the expanded name if we had test cases? Um, what's the result? And so on for the test. Well, so 
Now we can again look at just the failed results just by querying them on the object. We can look at all the failed blocks. We had none. And what we can also do, which we didn't see previously, is that there is the actual error message and the actual stack trace that the should would print attached on the object, on the error record object. So this is what should or what write a screen in the end uses to show you the actual message. So you can get that and you can reconstruct the whole output uh, later from the result object. And because this is very much used in your CI pipeline and your CI pipeline is probably written in a way that uh, expects pester 4 there is a convert to pester 4 result commandlet which takes the new result and converts it in the same format as the previous one was. So you can directly integrate it in your pipeline and uh, then migrate later if you have some advanced like BI or uh, a dashboard or something like that in your continuous integration. So this is how the final result looks like. We have this total count, uh, skip count, we have the test results and everything, everything that you had in the previous result. Now to demo some of the breaking changes. So the first breaking change that will hopefully not impact many is that the legacy should syntax is gone. And right now the error is pretty ugly, but before the final release, before you see this, it should actually improve at this point to the migration script. So this syntax was deprecated in version three and uh, it should no longer be used. So there is an easy regex that you can apply to your code base. It will get rid of the old should syntax and upgrade you to the new. Then there are changes in how mocks are scoped, and it now finally works in a logical manner. So they are scoped based on placement. So if I run those tests, they will work because this function is defined in before all, and then this mock is defined just for the it. So it doesn't leak into the whole describe, and it actually does what you would expect. It passes this test, but this test also pass it because the test uh, the mock doesn't leak into this test where we don't expect it but then if we define a mock in before all it will actually be defined for the whole block that contains the before all so it's kind of clever in which scope to use so it knows that this is in the describe and it should uh, be defined for all the it blocks and all the child describes that there are. So as you can see, both of the tests passed because we defined the mock here and it's effective in both of the blocks. With counting, it's very similar. So we can run those tests and we can see that all of them pass. So we have this function app mocked here in the before all, so the mock will be effective in all the tests. And then we invoke it here, and without specifying the scope, we can see that it scopes just to the it block. So it counts just this call as we would expect. And the same thing happens in this block below it. Okay, there is some mistake. Let me just run this one more time. And the same thing happens counting mocks. So in here, I can see that all the tests pass. So I'm defining the mock here and the before all. So it will be effective for all the tests that are in here. And it will also be effective for all the setup teardowns that are in this block. Now here in it, I invoke it once and then I count it without specifying any scope parameter. So it only looks in the it block. And then the next one, because the mock doesn't leak and so the counting also shouldn't leak, I invoke it one more time, specify that it should be called once, and it in fact is called just once within this block. Now I can still use the named scopes or I can use numbered scopes to count in the whole block, but it's not done by default. So I can still say 
I wanted f to be invoked exactly three times in this described, which so far happens. One call, two call, three calls. This test passes. Then in after each, I can also do the same thing, even though I don't think that would be done regularly. So should just scopes to the single test. So after each test, each test should invoke it just once, and that's exactly what happened. We are basically repeating this call in this call because after each runs in the same scope as the if. And then in after all, I scope it to the whole describe in the same way it would be scoped in here to the, to the whole describe. So it was called three times and we can see that and verify that. So it's F, 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 that's three times. So in this describe, it was called three times. So everything passes, even the teardown passes. Now, one more change regarding this is that the assert mock call was renamed to should invoke to align better with the other assertions. And so now instead of assert mock call, it's recommended to do should invoke. The syntax is pretty much the same. It's only that some of the parameters are no longer positional, but you probably wouldn't be using them as positional beforehand anyway. So we can still use assert mock called, it's just an alias we should invoke and it has this nice deprecation message. So the test passes, this is to me a much nicer syntax and as I said before, the full list of breaking changes is available in the best readme. Feel free to reach out and discuss them in the repo. So the migration is actually pretty simple. Most of the stuff that you need to do is to move your setups and your teardowns inside of a before all block, unless you generate tests, unless you do anything. So if your uh, test suit is already well behaved and it puts its setups into before all, the only thing that you need to do is to take the script setup, which is on top, and move it into before all. Also, if there is my invocation, my command that you use, which would be something like this, which is historical, very outdated, and very complex to write, you would have to replace that with something easier. For example, this, where we dot source from the ps command path, which is available everywhere, and we use uh, that to replace the tests and use just the one. So I wrote a blog post about them about those changes and you can find them on my blog to guide you from how to do the migration. There's also this migration script that will try to take the headers and automatically put them into a before all for you. But if you invoke the script, make sure that you are running in some kind of source control like Git to avoid losing uh, your changes or your changes being overwritten by the script if something goes wrong. So the migration basically is going from this, where we have a header and some code that's in between the describe and it, to this, where we have before all for the test setup, and then we have before all for the stuff that was between describe and it. To conclude, Pester 5 is available in PowerShell Gallery. Please go and try it out. Uh, migrate your scripts to it because that's where all the improvements will be happening in the future. It brings already numerous improvements and fixes, and I'm trying to work hard on continuing making it better and better. So thank you, and please consider sponsoring Pester.